Uh, and now our guest speaker, um, Jerry Kutskuva, uh, who is a recent Tucsonensa. He has come to our fair burg and um, is working here and uh, creating some wonderful things that he'll be sharing with us. He is Hopi uh, from the Bear Strat clan from the second Mesa village of Songopavi. And his Hopi name, Loma Hongva, means reed standing tall and healthy. He grew up near the Hopi reservation just outside of Flagstaff. And uh, his grandfather, William, carved dolls. And Jerry took uh, good notes, played close attention, and uh, then took up this craft himself. And he has, uh, and I'll be showing, I'll be sharing a few of his dolls that we have in our collection at the end of this, but his uh, earlier ones are a little more tradition, but he really branched out into some really great creative ways and with the, the soul of the Kachina, but with his own personal style. Uh, from there, he actually also has extended into painting and he'll be sharing you, with you a little bit of uh, this aspect of his artistic life. So uh, he just recently completed an 11 month uh, one man exhibit at the Ameren Foundation. Maybe some of you got to see it. And uh, so yeah, he's just looking forward to continuing to create and to share his work in art. And with that, uh, take it away, Jerry. Thank you. I'm kind of surprised to be living in Tucson again. This is my fourth move back. I originally came here uh, to go to college and had left for a variety of reasons, including working um, out on the reservation with my grandfather, um, actually leaving to go work for the movie industry for a while, which came about because of a very unusual thing that I was doing here in Tucson. Um, I started off as a carver, not carving the traditional art form of Hopi people. Um, I actually, was working in restaurants and notable places like the Palomino and one of the country clubs, which I can't quite remember the name of now, but I was carving ice. And it never dawned on me until later on in my life that um, carving sculpting was an, an art form of the Hopi. And since then, one of the things I always say is how the Hopi people I mean, it, it's, we have a very unique situation as a culture in that all Hopis are responsible for some sort of art form, either the carving of the dolls, the pottery, the, the basketry, the textiles. There's so many different art forms of Hopi that are still strong and alive that as a result, we all are born with that responsibility. So I say that we're born with a paintbrush in my hand. So that was kind of like my beginnings in the sculpting world here in, in Tucson back in the 80s. And then um, I actually left and have been gone for a long time. But there's been some changes in my life, uh, some major changes, uh, including the uh, separation with my wife, Debbie. We still are good friends and I go to visit her frequently so I can see my dog. Um, but um, it's been a very good move for us. And we decided that during the COVID period, it was a great time to kind of take some time off because I was very busy. So I've spent the last nine months here in Tucson getting myself up, getting prepared, and things seem to be falling in place, including this broadcast today. I, earlier this morning, signed a lease on a retail space in part of the WAMO uh, program here in the city of Tucson which is the artist colonies associated with Steinfeld Warehouse. Uh, so I will be setting up in a location here to show, share my work. And some of the things I'm gonna show you today is one of the things that you will be able to come and watch me work on, which is the Gnarly Roots, very substantial piece. And that will be in a public setting uh, made available to everyone uh, by appointment. But uh, once we get rolling, I have a feeling it'll be open more frequently. So let's let's get started with the whole process of what I've been going through since COVID hit. Um, I was just wrapping up my residency to uh, with Amarind when I mentioned to Eric that I was um, looking at moving down here. 
And Eric was so gracious to offer me a three month residency there at Ameren so that I had time to look for a place and find what I wanted. My dream was to, um, having lived here a long time ago, my memory was actually that uh, River Road was full of a bunch of farms with old um, bunkhouses and things like that. And I was actually living over on First and Roger uh, before Target was built. That was was it part of the field of the farmhouse that I was living on at that time. So my dream was to come back and find a bunkhouse somewhere along the river corridor. And um, I figured I had three months, so the possibility was pretty good. I was only at Ameren for about three weeks when the situation popped up that was exactly what I wanted. So I live on Craycroft, just south of the Rito River. Uh, and my backyard is the fork of the Pantano and uh, Pantano and Tanker Verde uh, washes. Uh, and I live here in pretty much a rural setting as what I had left up in Northern Arizona. Um, as, as I came to look at the house, it was really kind of interesting because I heard a, a squeal that was a familiar sound to me growing up on farms. And I look over and there's a pig coming to the fence uh, across the street from where I was at, where I was parked. And then as I looked up, there were horses over there. And it's like, oh my God, I'm home. And then I heard a red tail hawk um, squawk. It turns out there's a lot of squirrels here. So the red tails ha are having a blast hunting around here all the time, which means I can't do one of my favorite things and that is garden. So I've had to uh, look for alternative sources for that. But yes, I live in Tucson now and I plan on making myself public. So you guys will be able to see and watch the process of what I do. Um, one of the things I would like to talk about is what's happened over the last year. Uh, it has been a good time for a lot of us to sit back and take some time thinking about our lives, the direction it's going and um, relax. Yeah, uh, it wasn't fun at the beginning being stuck at home having to wear a face mask everywhere you went, but things are easing up now and it's good. And I hope many of you have found some new directions, some new things you would like to do with your life. Uh, I definitely have, and I'm still gonna be scrambling probably for another six months trying to get a regular routine going here, but it's exciting. Um, I've seen a lot of changes in a lot of people and there's been some, um, changes within themselves and their livelihoods to where I feel like we're going into a very positive time. Um, while we've had some difficulties within our country, it there's really has been a shift in consciousness. People are becoming more aware. I see more people spending time out in the country, out camping and fishing and things of that nature, which I think is very important for the children. Um, the, especially in the rural, uh, the urban areas uh, where the children have been caught more into the digital age as well as in the rural area. But I'm, I'm seeing more on the fishing websites with Facebook and places like that, uh, pictures of the children showing off their fish and everything. So I'm, I think we have a bright future coming up ahead. Um, so I got settled here and I've been trying to make determination on what I want to do volunteer wise. I, I gave up my um, responsibilities with the Verde Valley Ancestral Gardens in, in, in the Verde Valley area where we were building garden, a garden for the um, archeology span center. We also hosted a farmer's market and um, did roadside cleanup. Fortunately, the programs are still going on and I'm happy to see that at least while I was there, I did have some sort of uh, positive impact on the community. Now, I'm just taking a break from it all. It's been kind of nice not having to worry about that. And it's giving me time to start really evaluating what I've been doing art-wise. Um, I wanna go into a direction to where I'm speaking more about my concerns uh, regarding environment, food, agriculture, uh, and I want to do present it through art. Plus, I have some ideas for a radically new direction I want to go, um, which is unfamiliar with Hopi art as a whole. But I feel that's where I can really address the issues that, that concern me the most. So I've spent a lot of time thinking 
evaluating, getting to meet some new people. Fortunately, it, I find it kind of interesting because at the beginning, I had no clue as to how, who, any, how anybody looked that I met. It was kind of interesting. Um, but I've kind of joked a lot recently because it seems like there's been a lot of romances that have started. And I feel like there needs to be a book written about the, the, the relationships developed during COVID. So we've had some very interesting times and I've been slowly getting back to work. Uh, I got a studio set up here at my house now and I've been working on a few items. I have some examples like the paintings that you see back there and then a few dolls over here to the right. Uh, but I've been mostly just focused on getting settled. The main thing that I intend on doing, as I mentioned before, is the gnarly root. But let me share a little with you about what it is I do. My primary thing is carving Katsina dolls. Um, I initially started carving the dolls in a sculpture style. I really didn't want to do what the carvers were doing out of respect for them on the reservation and their life, the livelihood that they, uh, with all the responsibilities they have to the, uh, these uh, Katsina societies. So I came up with a different style, but I was also focusing on creating a style that would be recognized as unique and my style. I studied different works by different people and two people appealed to me in particular. One was Delbert Chanani, who had um, throughout the years been very influential on in the direction of Hopi carving. Uh, in fact, he kind of, uh, from what I've learned, was one of the first to be doing what was called sculpture, which is basically the head of the casino with random designs down below and no body. And then I also really enjoyed uh, the works by Wilmer Kay with respect to the quality of finish and the contemporary presentation. So between the two of them, I kind of came up with my style. And what I wanted to do was fuse the two styles uh, that were recognized by the museums, uh, the traditional style and the sculpture style. The, the traditional style at the time was what a casino looked like in dance formation with its arms up holding the regalia and all the proper clothing and dress uh, as if it were dancing uh, at the moment. And the sculpture style, as I mentioned, was just a head with random designs. Uh, but time has passed and the traditional style also has changed in that the traditional style is a renaissance of a, of a very ancient uh, style that used to be carved. So it's back in the foray now as, and as a result, we do have three different styles of Hopi uh, casino dolls. Uh, I'm happy to have had some effect and influence on the direction. Uh, and one of the main premises of carving casino dolls is we have to use the roots of cottonwood trees. So we don't have the luxury of going into stores and buying the roots unless it's one of the local Indian art stores that uh, likes to carry the root for their carvers that they buy from also. And there are a few people who go out and gather wood. Uh, there's a whole nother experience in searching for wood. I've been in many, many uh, dangerous situations, including uh, encountering a Mojave Diamondback, waking them up, having them very pissed off and having to back away real slowly before getting bit to sliding, almost sliding off the edge of a cliff when I was searching for wood up in Utah one time. So I've had people ask me if they could go with me on these um, journeys, but I feel it's too dangerous and I won't take anybody with me, which is dangerous in itself because I have nobody in case I uh, have an accident to back me up. So for Hopi Carvers, there is that concern. We, we do have to go out and find our, our own materials. And I, I relish on that fact actually, because it is quite a unique art form uh, in, in, in modern times. I remember seeing a billboard down in Phoenix one time that cracked me up. It was a uh, contractor and the sign said a family tradition since 1880 something, I believe it was. And I got to thinking about it. It's like, man, I need to put that on my business card. 
a fam family tradition since the 1600s. Um, so uh, it is definitely historical, carries, uh, the casinos carry a lot of meaning. They represent all things living, as well as there are some that have been created to acknowledge and honor other cultures or people with special uh, attributes. So uh, it is a very enjoyable way of teaching uh, through the dolls and their different meanings and how they apply to mother nature. Uh, you, you tend to grow to appreciate mother nature much more when you're out there all alone by yourself and uh, you don't hear anything whatsoever. But I wanted to share with you, I see where, um, uh, I wanted to share with you a little about this gnarly root project. Uh, about, it's been way more than 15 years now I actually found a piece of root uh, out in the uh, Verde River along the pond, uh, pecan farms in Camp Verde. It took more than 14 years to cure the piece of wood. And what it was was a, a massive conglomeration of a lot of different uh, roots that had fused together as time went by. This is what it looks like here. Um, it's called gnarly root. And I've been doing a blog on it on my website for quite some time. Uh, and um, what I've done is I've been fortunate to have received some um, fellowships and grants to work on this piece because I'm pretty busy when I'm at home doing my other projects. So I was happy to have some time where I was, uh, sent, uh, went somewhere else. My first excursion was in Santa Fe with the School for Advanced Research. And I thank them tremendously for having given me the opportunity to get this project finally going. And then I was able to go elsewhere. Uh, one of the places was up in, oh, thank you, Diane, uh, was up in Durango uh, in one of the smaller farming communities called Hesperus, which is where a major part of this work was, um, it was starting to refine more. But what this piece is ultimately is a matriarchal piece um, and, but however, the, uh, the area that I just focused on is the backside. I'll explain that in a second. Let me turn this around so you can see the other side. Um, I think there's roughly 32 casinos carved on it at the moment. But what I did is I wanted to start on the top with some of the more important figurines or figures. So I have a Sotlico right here with the Hawaii Wuti, the grandmother up in the center there. And then over on the side um, right here is the crow mother. So they, they represent uh, some of the more important female figures in the casino repertoire. And it all started um, at, at SAR one morning, uh, I had been spending my time getting the studio set up and they were so gracious to give me a, um, a um, house to live in that was kind of high up so I could see the city down below. And then uh, I wrote a blog about it um, that was titled 187 Steps. And it was about my journey from the front door of the house to the studio, which was kind of like set down in a little uh, canyon. Uh, and the first night um, I got the studio set up, I, was up, I stayed up kind of late and was just hanging out and checking it out. And then the next morning, I was all excited. I got my breakfast done, got things cleaned up and was heading down. And it's like, where am I going to start? I hadn't fully decided exactly what I wanted to do. And all of a sudden, it's like from looking at the doll all night, I guess it was time for us to start talking to one another. And I was walking down the driveway when a deer crossed my path. And it's like, OK, that's where I want to start. And I had one, one spot. It's right here. Uh, this is going to be uh, Deer Katsina, the female right here. Um, let's see, where is she at? Right about there, yeah. And, but I, there was this jagged section up above her. And I was really interested in this area here that's all jagged. It looks to me like a mesa, uh, like a village scene. Um, so I wanted to leave that there. Because one of the things I always enjoy when I go out looking for wood is the, the uh, how, how do I always say it, the, the, 
the ruggedness of Mother Nature and how tough she is on herself. And this is an example here of how the wood was just torn out of the ground. So these are all just fractures and everything. Uh, and then I wanted to have her, uh, the deer right above underneath her. So this is kind of where I started with. And from there, I just kind of allowed things to flow and was working down this section of the wood here. So I, what I've got is a series of female casinas on the front, uh, all kind of reflective of the early works of Wilmer Kay, to where he had multiple casinas coming, it, it flowing off of the uh, um, piece like that. And when I was cleaning the root, there was a bunch of bark on it, uh, all over it. And as I was cleaning it, one of the amazing things I discovered was this rock right here. Uh, it was like, wow, I didn't know it was there. And that kind of really got me into a frenzy cleaning it up and everything. And this branch or this piece of root that was coming up here actually did extend on to this here, which comes around to become the ear of corn on this side. And then I, it forked up higher behind another piece of root. So I went ahead and um, did like a dance wand right there. So this piece of root um, actually ended up becoming several uh, different symbolic meanings there. But the, this piece, this area here was fighting me and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I decided to walk away from this and focus on other areas. When one day I looked at it and I realized that this didn't need to be here, but this was the arm of a casino and what it was about, what, what the wood was telling me is that in our prayers, we also pray for the peace and harmony and goodness for all mankind. So sometimes it's like we're carrying that burden of life and that's what the, uh, uh, and Mother Earth, uh, because we also pray for, pray for the earth. So this is like a casino holding a rock on his shoulder um, as, as uh, a representation of carrying the burdens. At any rate, the front is all females. And I happened to be at a seminar one day where Kevin Poirier was speaking and he had just recently won best of show at the Santa Fe Indian market for a Buffalo horn conch belt that he made honoring uh, women artists or uh, influential uh, native women in uh, the United States. And he had actually um, made a comment during the presentation about the importance to acknowledge the women of present day. So there was one person on there that was, uh, he decided to do that with, and that had an effect upon me. I decided to go ahead and do the same thing. So down here, I did include a, a, a set of grandmother, mother, and, and a daughter, um, uh, like sitting over the village. But with the grandmother, what I did, let's see if I can get her more focused is I'm putting a basket above her, sort of to give an impression of a halo. And then I did not carve her in a body, but more like a tree stump. Uh, and the idea behind that is to emphasize the antiquity. And to us, part of the thing about the cottonwood trees is the roots, as a rule of thumb, grow deep, as deep into the ground as they do um, tall. So there are connection to the underworld, which is not a bad place, but a, a good place for us. And I thought that would be a good uh, way to symbolize her. So um, now as I go to the side a little more, again, the crow mother, and then I've got this unusual piece of wood here. And since I had done the, the sculptures in the Wilmer K style, there was one feature that Delbridge Hanani used to do all the time. And that was a little parrot with, that would have like flowers coming out. It always reminded me of the Jetson cartoon with a little, um, with a little spaceship would be going and the puffs of smoke would be, or clouds would be coming out. So I want to do that uh, with this piece to uh, honor Delbridge. Now on the back side, what I did was, um, what I'm doing is this is all the men in their responsibilities uh, to the culture. And um, one of the aspects of keeping the culture very strong so I have a sun face here, but over in this area here, uh, what I wanna do is this is a cloud. And then these little figures down here, I wanna carve men singing. So like they're singing to the clouds in prayer. Down here, I have 
um, a man who's gathering wood along with another man who's uh, gathering coal. This is going to be a wagon. And then I'd have at the very bottom a basket weaver, I mean, a textile weaver, somebody weaving a belt. Um, so I'm, I'm reflecting upon what the uh, men do. But there's been a lot of things I've done to um, that were done just quite simply because of what was happening or what was going on around me. And one of them was I had carved this guy down here. He's a priest who's going to be smoking a pipe. And I had a problem above him because there was this big ball and I did not know what to do with it. It looked like a big teardrop. And I was up in Durango uh, working, take, caretaking a house for a month so that I could work on this piece. And it happened to be when a comet came through and it was like, oh my God, I can't, you know, all of a sudden I realized that's what this is supposed to be. So what I'm doing is one of the star is here and his tail will go all the way up here to join with some of the uh, females up above in the casino. So there's been a lot of things on here. Those are a couple of them that I can recall really quickly that will be going on. And I still have a section to carve out here uh, in which like here, I've got feathers from a Satlako that's way up here. And um, what I'm doing there on the Satlako is he's actually uh, sharing the headdress with a, the, another Satlako that's on the back. So they will there'll be both the male and the female with the fam female in the front. But another thing that I did was with respect to our, um, our um, responsibilities about being humble and everything is I put the clown up here. I wanted important figures on the top, but I put the clown to where he was at the highest point. And that was to represent the clown and his ego and how um, he wanted to be at the highest spot. But then once he got up there, he discovered he was not, he didn't have any easy way of getting down. So he was kind of stuck. That was kind of reflective of our current uh, administration at the time. Because the clown sometimes with the mud that they use to paint his hair does look orange. So that's a little joke that I'm doing for myself. At any rate, the Satlako's feathers coming all the way down like that. And then on the backside here, my intention is to continue on with the responsibilities of the men. So I want to do a corn fill with some deer and then some men working down in the corn fill and hunters up above uh, to try to capture and reflect a lot more about the culture uh, and our way of life. So here in Tucson, that's what you're going to be seeing me carve at the studio. And if you guys want to come in and check it out, you're more than welcome. I've also kind of been bridging out and doing some paintings in a different style. And these are examples of those. Um, I've just been exploring, um, spending some time with myself, reflecting on the last 27 years since I became an artist and more notably the 20 years that I've been with Debbie and thinking about things that I need for my own personal growth and development. And uh, some of the things that I did like I wanted to start addressing things more contemporary. And there was a, a period where these monuments were being found um, all over the world and nobody knew where they were coming from and everything. So this was my interpretation of which I called it monumental prayers. And then I'm just experimenting with symbolism instead of doing the casino, which I always have been, I always did before. So I'm just playing around. This painting down here below, the red one, um, we proposed painting using that as a, a mural uh, in front of the building, but that kind of got squelched. It was going to be 27 feet long, and that's a pretty big project to be undertaking just to have a <laughs> building somewhere. And then more recently, I've been like, uh, like this piece here, just playing around. But I also am back in a mode of um, where my dreams seem to talk to me a lot. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm currently working on a painting over here um, that will be uh, a mesa with a field down below. But before that, in, in the foreground, are going to be a field of flowers with a uh, some butterfly casinas 
uh, the maidens just sitting inside of the flowers looking over the village. And so I've got a lot of different new ideas. And I've been, um, as I mentioned, punching out some new things. Here's some works in progress. Um, and I'm hoping that I can at least get one of these done in time for the Santa Fe Indian market. But otherwise, I've been working a little on the dolls, not a whole lot, but a little. And these are examples of some of the pieces that I currently have. Uh, we have a Hanumana here, a warrior mouse, and then this one's a peaky eater, then a Navajo Ye, and a, um, the Awatovi Ogre Woman. So I've been playing around a lot and getting myself right in the, in the space again to start doing what I enjoy the most. Incidentally, I don't know if anybody's aware of these, but I have two posters here. Uh, let's see if I can get that one. This is, to me, one of the most important posters I have at the moment. This is a one-off from the Smithsonian. Um, I had the pleasure of doing a show there. And let me see if I can get that close or not really. Um, they had a marquee that was uh, four feet by eight feet out in front of the National Museum of American Indian. And this, that was the image it was on. And then the other was one year when I was um, recognized and acknowledged at the herd for my distinct style. This is a corn maiden. And then it was signed by a bunch of Hopi carvers that were there for the Hop Hopi show. So I've been spending a lot of time just reflecting, thinking about my life thinking about what it is I want to do and I'm really enjoying things and laughing a lot, getting to visit with a lot of friends and everything around the Tucson area that I've had for many, many years. And I'm actually looking forward to being able to reach out and uh, connect with a lot of the um, people I met through the Arizona State Museum that became wonderful collectors. Uh, so Again, I'm looking forward to getting the studio open and our grand opening is scheduled for, uh, I think it's the third, it's the first Saturday of next month, which is when the other, um, the other arts um, colonies uh, that's associated with the WAMO project uh, are done. Uh, so if you would like uh, to, receive updates or anything, you can go to my website and sign up there. And I will also be posting blogs uh, with respect to the gnarly route and where I'm at with it. And as I said, uh, if, if you're in town visiting or, uh, or you live here, you're always welcome to give me a call and come over and visit at the studios. So this is one of your <laughs> earlier pieces. I think we got this in the 1990s. Do you have... Uh... Any recollections or any thoughts about this particular one? It's all acrylic. Okay. Uh, that's one of my earlier works. And when you when you go to Hopi during the summertime, you will see eagles perched upon uh, the rooftops. And they are there to watch our uh, way of life to make sure we're still living a good way of life. And this, this guy, uh, the next two uh, we got from um, Linda and Art Stobitz, who were uh, great, great friends. I, I was hoping Linda would join us. She's in Chicago, but um, she actually anyway. wanted to, but she had an appointment, so she's oh. going to catch the video. Okay, well, good. Uh, you want to know something interesting? Is that the same one in your... <sighs> oh, I've got to turn it this way. Yeah. Yeah, that one is actually right there on the poster for the Smithsonian. Yeah, okay, so it's it, this is very famous, so I really don't want to drop it. <laughs> I, you know, I was wondering where that one was at. I could not well, figure it's, it it's out. it's right here. It's saying hello to you again. <laughs> yeah. That's good to know. Oh, I did, uh, one of the things that I was going to point out, because you were talking about petroglyphs, I don't yeah. know whether you can see uh, the, the, is this something you do pretty regularly is put little glyphs on your base? I used to, right now I've been doing more just like a uh, rock wall okay. on the side. I, it, I kind of just change it up every so often, but I had a very unusual and fun experience with those guys. 
one year I decided to go to a ceremony that was, um, I got there too late and it was closed off. So nobody could go in and there must have been, I don't know, 10 or 15 of those, the one, the piece you were holding up mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, that's the broad face and he's a guardian and they were protecting the village. This is one of those ceremonies that occurs in the middle of the night. And they have a cowbell on their back and you can hear them in the dark moving around and everything. And we were trying to figure out how to sneak into the village so that we could see the ceremony, which meant somehow sneaking into the village, getting to one of the kivas and then sneaking into the kiva without anybody noticing. Impossible feat, but we were gonna do it anyway. And uh, they kept chasing us away in different directions. And finally, they, I think they got tired of us. So they got all ganged up on us. And going into the village, the roadway is right on the edge of the mesa. And when you get to the top, there's this little shed just to the left that's on the edge. There's about a foot uh, behind the shed, maybe more like 18 inches behind the shed uh, that was flat, that was part of the mesa. And they chased us and we ran behind there. So we were sitting there and it was nothing but straight down from that point. <laughs> so it was about at least a hundred feet, you know, and they were reaching around with their yucca trying to hit us. And we were moving from one side of the shed to the other. And finally it got quiet and my nephew was missing. I didn't know where he was at. And finally somebody leaned around the corner and said, you guys better get out of here before you hurt yourself. So we went around the corner and was leaving and the roadway going up into the village is uh, like a uh, brickwork rock, uh, the sandstone uh, built up to, for, the, for the flat surface of the roadway. And as we're walking around the corner of the shed, there's my nephew hanging on to the edge. Just he didn't know what was going on, but here he was. He had actually gone over the edge of the mesa and was holding on to the rock. So oh they gave us quite a scare that night and fire. Yeah. <laughs> Learn to, to mine the uh, broad face. Oh yeah. Arts. Oh yeah. Don't pick on those guys. Yeah. Okay. So this is the this is the last one, um, and um, also from the uh, Stavitzes. Yes, that's a crow mother, and she's considered to be the mother of all monsters, uh, that being the, uh, the um, ogres. And um, she's one of the more significant figures because she's also responsible for the initiation ceremony. So I do enjoy doing her a lot. Yeah, th this, this is uh, just absolutely amazing. And she has a little, uh, the bundles of uh, feathers in her hand. Is that what those are? Yes, exactly. Okay. And then uh, that one, I believe, was in your exhibit you had several years ago. Yeah, both of them were. Oh, they and, both uh, were. Yeah, so we, we uh, got to share those. Okay. Sure. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Jerry. And I imagine you'll be seeing some of us at your doorstep. Uh, definitely down at Whammo. Good on Whammo. They're, they're a really important um, arts group in Tucson. We're really lucky to have them. And, uh, and if anybody and, wants to follow what I'm up to, just, like I said, go to my website. You can sign up for the blog. But I thank you guys for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, I really enjoyed this a lot. Take care. Thank, thank you, right, everybody. Then. This was a strong program to end on. And Diane, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you because this has been a crazy year and you really embraced the Zoom, even though it was you know, technologically scary and um, frustrating at times. But it just shows that you are always just so ready and eager to present. You're a great presenter and just anything you can do to share the collections, you are always willing to do and you are unrivaled at the museum in doing that. And so I appreciate you and um, I congratulate you and the friends on having such a great year of programs uh, despite the pandemic. And um, I hope that you get some much needed vacation time this summer. Well, and we could never have done any of this without you, Darlene. So back at you. All right. All right. Take Bye, care. Everybody. Bye bye. Take care, everybody.